until this point, we spent a lot of time on fur trade relations. But as the fur trade gave way to more permanent European settlement, relationships between indigenous peoples and Europeans changed dramatically. For the most part, fur traders were solid allies of indigenous peoples, hoping to prevent permanent agricultural settlement on their lands. Both parties saw the preservation of this habitat to be a necessity in maintaining the economic advantages of the fur trade. Settlement, however, envisioned a very different relationship with the land. Settlement, of course, involved long-standing habitation of the same plot of land. It also displaced indigenous peoples in a way that the fur trade didn't. Settlement also involved the relocation of thousands of European families to indigenous territories. But rather than reject this process outright, indigenous peoples in what is now Western Canada sought to benefit from the arrival of new peoples to their land. They saw this time of change as something that could be potentially positive, but could also be negative. And it was this mentality that drove them to negotiate treaties with the Europeans, granting British and Canadian access to Indigenous territories. The major treaties in southern Saskatchewan, treaties 4 and 6, were negotiated under very different circumstances than historians usually present them. Indigenous peoples were in no need to negotiate the treaties, there was still plenty of buffalo to survive off of, and they could more or less maintain their traditional way of life throughout the 1870s. However, they negotiated treaties with the expectation that the, the, the agreements would provide benefits to both Europeans and Indigenous peoples. The long-term result would be a situation where Canadians and Indigenous peoples could share the land, live on that land together, but would exist in a political world where neither party would seek to govern the other. The access to the land was also specifically defined. In tre both treaties four and six, indigenous peoples ensured that they would be able to exist on the land as they had for generations, and that European agriculture would not conflict with their way of life. In treaty six specifically, as we will see, indigenous peoples were um, assertive that the crown could not access any land below the depth of a plow, or about six inches. So indigenous peoples sought to preserve the integrity of their land, even if people were farming on top of it. The key component that we'll be exploring over the next few weeks is the crown's argument that indigenous peoples extinguish their title and their rights to their land. Interestingly enough, in both treaties in four and six, which are the most documented of all the treaties, Indigenous peoples did not even discuss the possibility of land surrender. Rather, it was a negotiation for access. While the written treaties themselves all make reference to a cede and surrender of Indigenous territory, the documentation around the negotiations, including the transcripts uh, kept by the Crown Commissioners for those treaties, never made reference to any kind of debate over this. What we have in effect are at least two versions of each of the treaties, an oral tradition held and passed down by indigenous knowledge holders and a written version that the Crown treats as supreme. We'll be exploring both in this module and with a particular focus on the validity and the importance of understanding the oral version of Treaty 6 and understanding what kind of relationship that envisions in order to better understand the written treaty and the context in which we all share this land.